Father, you are a gracious God. You're a loving God. Father, we come to you grateful for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. Father, you have given us your spirit as a confirmation of our assurance in you, Father. I pray that everyone who is here today, who has been made new in Christ, will come to know more about their identity in Christ and the freedom that comes from that. And if there is anyone in our assembly today who has not put on Christ, Father, I pray that they will consider these things and that your spirit will work in their heart. Father, thank you for this time together, together. Be with my lips and the things I say. Go before me and be with all of us as we approach you today. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Spending a few years in the hollow turned me into a bird enthusiast, a bird watcher. And one of the birds that you don't see many of them around here, but it's a, it's a bird that there's many different species of. It's called a kingfisher. And what a kingfisher does, there's the different varieties, but the famous one, they hover above water, even as, as high as eight feet above water, and they spy a bird, or excuse me, they spy a fish in the water, and what they'll do is they'll dive and they'll drop into the water, and their beak will go straight into the water, catch the fish, and then they fly back out. They're like a hummingbird. Their, their wings will flap like that. And they'll catch a fish this way. And if you think about all the things that have to work in order for them to be successful at that, they have to, one, have the strength to be able to hover that high. They have to have the vision to be able to see all the way through the water. They have to understand how, for those of you who have ever tried to to spear a fish in water, realize that light bends as it hits water. So they have to be able to gauge that where the fish looks like it is, it's not actually where it is. And they have to be able to go under, and they have this special uh, piece of skin that covers their eye that protects them from the water so that they can keep their eyes open while they're underwater. And they have to be able to catch this fish, which is just this tiny target from eight feet, and they catch it and come out. It's an amazing, remarkable Bird. And there was a poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, in the 1800s, who wrote a poem that, that started talking about this bird, but really he's talking about all these different things in creation that live up to their name and that express who they are and why they are named what they are through the way they live and through what they do. And that's why the kingfisher is called the kingfisher. It's literally the king of fishers. And the poem speaks about this, but he also compares this to really a better way to live, the life of the just man, the just person who finds his identity somewhere else. And this poem goes like this. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones rain. As each tuck string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Selves, goes itself. Myself, it speaks and spells. Crying, what I do is me. I say more. The just man justices, keeps grace. That keeps all his goings graces. I catch this. Acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is. Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. What is he talking about in that poem? Some of you don't care anything about poetry, and that's fine, I, under, I understand. But think about what is he talking about? What's he saying? He's saying that everything in creation, including mankind, believes that its purpose is to find its identity in itself, and to live accordingly. But he's saying that the just man, the one who chooses a different life, knows that his identity is in someone else. And he lives freely knowing that when God looks at him, God doesn't see that person. He sees Christ. He sees that person through Christ's vision. That's exactly what Paul is talking about here in this reading that B.J just read for us. There's a joy and a richness in being like Christ in God's eyes. If you're taking notes, I put this on the bulletin or you can do it in your Bible. I want you to highlight either now or at some point in the future 
every phrase or instance of the word in Christ, that phrase in Christ or in him, it's all over the place in Ephesians and especially in this passage. And Paul is telling us something when he says that. So who is Paul writing to when he writes this letter of Ephesians? Well, he's writing to a church in the first century, this church in Ephesus. And this church is made up of two different sets of people. There's Jews there who have all of this scriptural history but have now put their faith in Christ. And they have seen everything that the, the law in the Old Testament was speaking about. And not all the Jews saw that. In fact, there are Jews today who still do not believe that Jesus was the true Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah. But there's Jews here who believe that Jesus is the Christ, but there's also Gentiles. And what's a Gentile? Well, all of us here are Gentiles, because we are not Jews. We don't have this heritage. We didn't literally descend from Abraham. And yet they are people who, through belief in Christ, have now been included in the kingdom. So he's writing to a group of people who are made up of different walks of life. And really, there's probably some tension here and some of the ideas that are conflicting. Whereas the Jews on one side are, are saying, we have all of this history and you have none of that. Whereas the Gentiles are saying, yes, but in, in Christ, we have been accepted into the, the kingdom, into the body. And so there's this disunity here. And so Paul's going to talk a lot about unity. But it's important to understand that he's writing to really two different groups of people. And in this first passage, he's speaking primarily to the Jews. And we know that because when you get to verse 13, which we'll cover, Lord willing, next week, he turns his attention to the Gentiles and says, in him, you also, or you Gentiles also. But it's important to note he's speaking primarily to the Jews here. And he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. How's that for a run-on sentence? It's a long sentence, He says there. In Him, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. It's important to note here, when he's talking about He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, we have to remember and understand that God made a covenant with a people. And He made that covenant specifically with Abraham. And He called Abraham. And we talked about that in Sunday school today, how Abraham, by faith, lived out and carried out this promise to him and demonstrated his faith through his life. But there's this covenant that God makes with Abraham in Genesis 17, 7, where He says, I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Now hear that. Abraham doesn't know who's going to come after him or what's going to come after him. At this point, he doesn't even have a son. He doesn't know how this is going to happen. But here God is saying, I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And so when Paul is speaking to the Jews here, these people... He's talking about this God who has chosen them and has been their God forever. Not just since Abraham, but He predetermined this before the creation of the world, before the foundation of the world, that He was going to do this according to the purpose of His will. So when you think about a covenant like this, 
What kind of covenant is this? There's no terms here. It's an unconditional covenant. He says, I will always be the God of your descendants after you, long after you're gone. The kind of covenant that that is, is is like the covenant, really, or the relationship that a parent has with their child. Let me ask you this. If your child leaves and never returns, never speaks to you again, are they still your child? They're always your child. And you're always their parent. Now, there's a strain in that relationship. There's tension in that relationship. But they will never stop being your child. All these children that are here today, parents, you can look at them and realize you will always be their parent. They will always be your child, no matter what happens. And that's the promise that Paul is talking about here, and it's the promise that God made with Abraham. I will always be your father. I will always be the father of your descendants after you. So the chosen were predestined in Christ. It's important for adoption as sons to be like the beloved. What does that phrase beloved make you think of? It makes me think back to Jesus' baptism. When God says, what? When Jesus is baptized. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying that he has chosen to bless us in the beloved, meaning in Christ. But this isn't just saying he chose a blessing to give us through Christ and in Christ, but literally he is blessing us the way he has blessed Christ. This is where we come back to that poem and thinking about being like Christ in God's eyes. Think about that phrase, the beloved. Do you feel beloved by God? There's a song uh, on Caleb that plays, for those of you who listen to it, where it says, you are beloved. You are beloved, essentially, is exactly what it's saying. But do you believe that? Do you believe that God loves you the way he loves Christ, not because you've done some great things, but because you have put yourself in Christ? You have been clothed with Christ. Think about that. That's important. Paul is saying that this is exclusive, this type of love. There's an, for a big word, exclusivity to this love. It's exclusive to the people who are in Christ, meaning he has chosen to pour out all of his love the way he loves his son, Christ. He's chosen to pour that out on all who will believe, on all who will put their faith in. In him. That's the promise that we have. And so we can't miss that. And it may be challenging for us to think, okay, where do we come in? Because you keep saying this is about the Jews. Is this only for the Jews or is this for everyone? Well, that's where the phrase in Christ is so important because as we're going to see, the more we go through this text, and for those of you who are doing our reading plan, you'll see that in the book of Ephesians, that this is going to be open to everyone. In fact, it already has been opened to everyone that God is determined to pour out his love on all who believe in him and who are in Christ. But for now, I want you to think about the exclusive nature of his love. Turn to Psalm 8 with me now. Psalm 8 is a beautiful psalm that speaks about the, really the wonder of really understanding this love and really grasping this love that God has for us. He says... In Psalm 8, verse 1, this phrase that he repeats at the end of the psalm. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also beasts of the field, 
the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What's he saying here? He's saying that out of everything you have made, out of all of these good things, even these miraculous things like this kingfisher bird that can do something that none of us can do, all of these little things in God's creation, when you think about all the plants and animals and and the, the clouds and the weather systems, everything that God has made that we can't even really fathom the depth of his wonder and his creation, the psalmist is saying, who am I? that you would pay attention to me out of all of these things? Who am I that you would visit me? And Paul is really saying the same thing here. Who are we that you would visit us and give us a way to come to you in Christ out of all of these things you have made? When we think about application for a sermon, for a lesson, sometimes we think about application, and I've said this before, as as something you you strip out. Like, it's what's the, the... the message inside the fortune cookie that we take that we can put in our pocket and and walk away from. But when you think about application, I think about application as the way you would apply a coat of stain to to wood. Because I've worked with a lot of wood and that's where my mind goes. When you apply a coat of stain, what happens to the wood? It takes on a new nature. It's different. It's not the same as it was before. And really it's hard to go back from that. Once you've got it, you better make sure you have the right stain. Staining the truth of God's word to us is the same. When we think about an application, it shouldn't be, I've got just some extra knowledge to walk away with today. We should think of it as, I have a truth that's now been painted to my heart, stained to my soul, and now I am changed. I'm different. That's what spiritual transformation looks like and feels like. So I want you to stain this truth to your heart. What does Paul Call the people in verse 1. What does Paul call them? I want you to look at your Bibles this morning if you have them open. He calls them saints. And we think about a saint as someone in the Catholic sense, as someone who has done some great acts and they have been awarded sainthood. But the New Testament calls believers saints. All of us are saints. Peter calls us priests. He says... You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are saints. So what I want you to stain to your heart today is this truth. If you have put your faith in Christ, if you have died to your old self and been raised in Christ, a new creation, you are a saint, you are beloved, you are holy in God's sight. Why? Because when God looks at Jesus Christ, he sees perfection. He sees holiness. He sees righteousness. And when we are clothed with Christ, God has given us a way to look that way in his eyes. To be like Christ in God's eyes. When was the last time you really felt that way? I want, I want you to really think about that this morning. When was the last time you really looked at your life and thought about it and said, I'm holy in God's eyes. I'm loved in God's eyes. God truly cares about me because I have stepped into his love in Jesus Christ. Do you feel that way? Because if you have put him on, you should feel that way. And it should change the way you do everything. If you don't, you're having an identity crisis. You're putting too much of your identity in yourself when really all of it should be in Jesus Christ. When when Matthew records Jesus saying, look at the birds of the air, look at the sparrows, look at the flowers of the field. God takes care of them. God takes care of this little flower of the field. And and Solomon wasn't even arrayed in such splendor in all of his wealth that he had. He was nowhere near as beautiful as this little flower that God takes care of. So will God not also take care of us? Look at the birds of the air. They don't 
worry where food is going to come from. That kingfisher above the water doesn't worry, are there going to be fish in the water to eat? Because God takes care of them, His creation. So will He not also take care of us who are made in His image? So if we are living with worry and with anxiety and and fear and, and uncertainty in this life, we are not standing in the image of Jesus Christ. We're standing in our own identity, in the old way of the world. And we're failing to acknowledge the fact that God has blessed us in Christ and that He loves us in Jesus Christ. I hope this is true for you. If you have become a Christian, as I said, I really want you to leave this morning at least thinking about this, considering this, and allowing this truth to pervade your soul in your heart to believe that God actually does love you. He's pleased with you in Jesus Christ. Does it mean you've done everything perfect? It means that He has provided a way for you to walk in step with the Spirit who is perfect. And if you haven't put on Jesus Christ in faith, if you haven't been baptized into His death and raised in a new life, this is the sales pitch of the Christian life. This is what it's all cracked up to be. A full, good, pleasurable life filled with joy, filled with assurance. I hope you'll consider these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to be together, to be in your word, Father. I pray that these things, that these truths, Father, will be stained to our hearts, that your spirit will work and will be present in ways that we don't understand, convicting our hearts, challenging us, and reaffirming our stance in Christ. And if there are any who are seeking, Father, who are wanting to put their faith in you, Father, I pray that your spirit will uh, convict them of sin and, and challenge them to see this, Father. We pray for this church in the days ahead. We pray for this community, that you will open our eyes to the people of this community, Father. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.